Hi, my name is Taylor Pettis and welcome to today's presentation, Leads Rule, the key to high performance online lead generation. As we all know, sales and revenue begin with leads. Today's presentation is designed to introduce you to how your organization can generate more higher converting leads by implementing just a handful of different digital marketing tactics. We'll get this from Dan DeRosier, a vice president and partner at 3D Marketing. But before I introduce Dan, I want to cover just a handful of housekeeping items. First of all, we hope the presentation will be both informative and interactive. And to help make it interactive, please share your comments and questions in the chat area of the webinar screen. And I'll do my best to help Dan answer your questions and keep up with them during the presentation. So if you have questions, please keep them coming. The next item is we are recording today's webinar and all of you will be emailed a copy following the event. So if you like what you see or want to share this presentation with your connections, please feel free to do so. Now. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan DeRosier. Dan is the Vice President of Sales at 3Deep Marketing, a digital marketing agency located in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a recognized expert in channel sales and has presented on this and other topics both in the United States and in Europe. Dan is passionate about using digital marketing to increase revenue and ready to share his thoughts with you. So here's Dan DeRosier. Thanks, Taylor. Welcome to our Leads Rules Seminar. This is Dan DeRosier with 3D Marketing. The reason that we're focused on Leads Rule, it turns out important topics that digital marketing companies are talking about today. The way we're going to start our presentation is we're going to just show you a few stats about lead generation. Then we're going to talk about how websites can help you get more visitors. We're then going to focus on how digital presence, if you don't have one, how you can use paid search to help you there. Then we're going to teach you how to turn more prospects into customers, understand how you can dominate local search, and then what to do with those leads that aren't so hot. Then ultimately going to wrap up and talk a little bit about how you can perpetually improve your lead generation programs. So the reason why this seminar is so popular is that when you look, about, you look at digital marketing objectives for B2B companies, generating leads is their number one objective when they're talking about what they want to do from an online perspective. And that really makes sense. A lot of the leads that are generated, whether they're traditional channels or on digital channels, it is about generating leads and turning it over to a sales force to ultimately close. But you can see secondary goal from a B2B perspective is drive sales. Now when you talk B2C companies, driving sales is their number one objective and a lot of them have e-commerce plays. But secondly, the most important objective, again, is to generate leads for their organizations. In a lot of cases, whether you're B2B or B2C, it's not always just a traditional relationship you're looking at where you have a sales rep and you have uh, your online properties. We're also talking about situations where organizations might have um, franchise or franchisee locations, might be uh, distributors or dealer networks. The same principles apply to those organizations from a leads rule perspective as they do to traditional organizations that might have uh, brick and mortar retail locations or sales locations throughout the country. When you think about your digital presence, I'd like to show it to you in this way. So your digital presence there in the middle is really your website. It's kind of the hub by which all activity happens. But there's different elements that drive to that hub. On the top, you have paid media and the different elements associated with paid media. You have local search with Google My Business, directories and reviews. You have social with Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, other channels uh, like Pinterest as an example. And then on the left, you have SEO, on-page SEOs, content strategies, you know, uh, also uh, content marketing. These things all collect, create your digital presence, generally your website is the hub of this activity and now we're going to figure out what are some ways to enhance that to further drive lead flow. So when you think about that digital presence, now imagine that's the top of the funnel. You have all these activities that are driving from the top of the funnel and what we're trying to do is broaden that funnel, get more relevant traffic in and that funnel then drives to your website, landing pages, which ultimately we hope turn into inquiries, leads, and ultimately customers. And so what we've decided to do for the Leads Rules Seminar is break it down in this way where we're going to take the funnel from top to bottom 
and show you specific ways where we found where companies lack or have gaps or challenges in their lead funnel and we hope to give you some tips today that will help you improve yours. So our first point on leads rule is how websites generate more visitors. When you think about a website and you're found online, the way you're found is something called organic search. And most people, when they're searching, in this case, they're saying 79% of search engine users frequently or almost always use natural search results. They click on them when they're looking for something online. So let's take an example of if I was Googling the best zero turn uh, mower uh, and was interested in doing that uh, and interested in buying one. So you can see three areas here. You can see the product listing ads at the top. You can see paid ads off on the right. And then you can see organic search traffic on the lower left side. This is the traffic that we're talking about and should link, these are, these are areas that you should be found at where you're ranked organically. You can see here the top three results in this specific case are actually not lawnmower uh, manufacturers at all, but other sites that have aggregated good content and it's ranked well uh, in the search engine indexing. So we're gonna focus on how to improve getting companies that are actually selling mowers, the top ones here we'll talk about later, uh, as well as some of these lower ones. When you think about uh, search engine optimization, most organizations have it wrong. And what you hear most people say is, look, you just need more content. You just need more content and make it relevant. That is true, but it's actually the second step of the process. The first thing you need to do is you need to focus on the foundation of your website. These are the technical attributes of your website. Things like, uh, are you getting server error codes? How are you doing redirects, 301s, 302s? What's your server response time? Uh, Google recommends uh, that if you want to keep your rankings high from an SEO perspective, your, your server times are under two seconds. And then when you move up on the foundational areas, you have your on and off page factors. And we're going to actually show you some exact examples of what on page factors are um, so you're familiar with those and can monitor those yourself and fix them. After you've done those base foundational elements, it's only then that you should really start talking about developing a content strategy by doing some keyword research, writing new and relevant articles that are aligned with both the way people are searching and the product or services you offer, and then doing content marketing, getting that content uh, published and put in front of the right people at the right time. Here's an example of a Toro Lawnmower website. And so we're just using this as a way to give you an example of what are some of the elements that actually affect these base foundational uh, SEO tactics that we talked about. A title tag here at the top, Toro Super Recycler Lawnmower. It should be descriptive and written in the native language if you happen to be in a, mul a multi-language uh, company. URL, make sure that the structure is very clear and it doesn't have uh, question marks uh, or other symbols that can confuse search engines and cause them to think that there might be duplication out there. H1 heading, think about that as the top part of your um, page and talking about what that specific category should be about. Ideally, it should be non-branded phrase. A lot of people might not know super, super recycler, but they would know uh, a push behind mower. Alternative text, search engines can't read images, and so you have to have uh, text behind that image that actually describes what is actually on that page. And then H2 tags or headings are further descriptions of the page, and pages can have more than one. But when you're talking about a title tag, H1, you usually have one per page. So with that as a foundation, those are the things you should start with as far as fixing the foundation of your SEO um, pyramid. And one of the tools that we use, we use multiple tools when we do these uh, scans for clients, as we call them, is Screaming Frog. So our suggestion would be take your website, run through Screaming Frog. It's a free tool, and it'll give you an assessment of how well you're doing. You might be surprised. In many cases, we're finding when we do these uh, assessments, 
that most organizations are in the 35 to 55 percent range relative to what we would call search engine effectiveness. That means they're about running at half speed, that they could be doing a lot more in that area and could be found substantially more frequently if they would just fix some of those base elements. Once you actually do that assessment, then take those low-hanging technical challenges and fix them on your site. And if you're not if you're not sure how to fix them, then work with a reputable SEO organization to help you do that. Now that you've fixed the foundation, then what you really want to do is focus on keyword research. That will tell you what are popular terms out there relative to the target markets that you're going after, and then use those keywords to think about what content might be relevant. And then now the hard lifting comes. It's actually write you know, good, engaging, relevant content and then optimize it before you put it on the web. And then after you've done that, certainly publish it, but have an ongoing SEO plan. Uh, SEO is one of those areas uh, with a lot of, there's over, there's a couple hundred algorithms that Google, as an example, uses for search, and they're always changing. So you always need to be refreshing uh, and looking at SEO if you wanna stay up there and keep your organic rankings and get more visits uh, for people looking for your products and services. Now we're gonna focus on point two, which is getting a digital presence so potential buyers are where they're actually searching. Forrester did a study that basically said, look, most people click on the first three or four results and then move on. And we all know what move on means. Move on doesn't mean going to page two or page three. What it means is move, move on means I hit the back button, I retype in a different search string, and then I hit enter again and kind of figure out exactly what I found. And if I don't find it, I do the same thing again. It's very unusual that most people go to page two or page three. In fact, from a, a organic perspective, uh, about 70% of traffic always ends up clicking on page one. But a way to augment that is that you might use paid media to augment that if you're not showing up on page one for certain terms. But before we actually show you how to do that, a lot of companies actually ask us, well, how do I know if I'm getting enough traffic from an organic perspective to even decide whether I should focus on doing some paid media? HubSpot did a study about a year ago, and what they were able to determine is that it's actually based on the number of employees that sort of dictates about how many um, weekly website visits that a website typically gets. And that kind of makes sense. You would think the bigger the organization, the more pages they would have. So it sort of makes sense that it would also equate to the number of employees. So as an example, I'll just pick on the 51 to 200 range. If you're a B to B business, you should on average be getting about 711 uh, searches, uh, visits a week. If you happen to be a B to B, B to C company, about 1600 searches. And that's pretty typical that B to B companies are about half or less of what a B2C company. So this is just a general guideline, but it'll at least give you some indication as to whether you need to spend more time from an organic perspective that we just talked about, because I'm not getting enough traffic, or if that traffic doesn't culminate in enough inquiries, use paid media to drive additional traffic. So just to refresh everybody, we're gonna go back to a search screen. In this specific case, I'm looking for a siding contractor. And again, you can see the paid traffic up on the top uh, left and right, and you can see organic traffic. In this case, we're really talking about paid traffic and how you can drive more leads. Here happens to be a company that uh, that's a siding contractor down in Texas, Amazing Siding. Now, I was looking for siding, but when I landed on their page, Amazing Siding does a lot of things. They have Infinity Windows, James Hardy, Marvin Windows, Integrity, Provia. In a lot of cases, if I'm looking for siding and I land here, I'm really sort of confused and I'm not exactly sure what I should do. Um, and I might not even know that James Hardy is a siding contractor yet. So in a lot of cases, what we've done is we've worked with major manufacturers and their top dealers and actually create very focused pages that support both the, the local brand, Amazing Siding in this case, and the manufacturer, in this case, James Hardy. And what we're doing, instead of driving them to the dealer's microsite, we're actually driving traffic to these co-branded um, 
paid landing pages or microsites. The good news about this is that they're very focused. Homeowners get here, they know what the next steps are. And what we've found is that we've been able to increase conversion rates on these pages, reduce the cost per inquiry, increase lead flow, and actually drive more demand for both the manufacturer, in this case, Hardy, as well as the dealer, in this case, Amazing Siding. And imagine the amplification you get when you implement holistic programs like this for organizations that have hundreds or thousands of dealers. If you're thinking about doing paid media, a lot of people don't understand that they really have a double, what I call the double funnel. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when we work with companies that I go, well, how well are things going currently? What they'll tell you is that, well, I've got about a $5 cost per click in this case. Well, my, my comment there is what's really your cost per acquisition and what's your cost per sale? And we're going to talk about that. So in this specific case, it's just saying there's in this given market, there's about 200 searches. You get X number of impressions, how many people actually clicked in, uh, to visit. And, and the click-through rate is when somebody actually clicked on your ad, it cost you $5. But the more important factor here is conversion. If your website or your landing page has a 3% conversion, you really had $167 cost per acquisition. That's the uh, initial number that you should really be looking at to know whether there's a payback for you and the payback's all going to depend on your profit margins and the selling price of your projects, etc. So these 100 inquiries we received cost us each $167. But those are raw inquiries. Those aren't leads yet. What you have to understand now is the second funnel, which we I call this the raw inquiries. We have our 100 inquiries. You have to understand what happens with your CRM systems and what sort of close rates you have once you get those raw inquiries. We're working with some companies where we're managing the inbound lead flow, so we kind of have an idea, and your funnel will be different than others, but here's a pretty typical example of, of um, companies that are in the home improvement space. You get about 60% of those 100 inquiries are set into appointments, 75% of those are issued, 75% of those there's actually a demonstration done, whether it's at a retail location or an in-home demo, and 12, 12 of those deals closed. And these numbers off to the right just are show, indicating the fallout that happens at each of these steps. And the, and the opportunity we're going to talk about later is there's some nurturing opportunities for these leads that didn't initially close but should be still marketed to to get incremental um, to get incremental um, uh, quality leads and push those again to the sales organization. So you can see from here, 100 initial inquiries, 12. Let's try to increase the, um, the close rates and let's make sure that we're nurturing the leads that don't close. One other way to look at this is we talked about the cost per click. We also talked about at a 3% conversion rate, that's now $167, so don't focus on cost per click, focus on cost per acquisition, but ultimately you want to understand what happens with that cost per as you drive further down the funnel, and in this case, it cost the organization $1,411 of marketing for a $25,000 deal. That's about 5.6%. Is that good, not good? It really depends on the industry, the product, and the profit margins of those organizations. But these are the things you should be focused on to understand whether paid media makes sense for you. So in summary around paid media, we're talking about this part of the funnel. Look at uh, the cost per click and the cost per acquisition. One of the tools that we like to use is Google uh, Keyword Planner. It's a great tool. It's free. You do need an AdWords account, uh, but you don't have to use your credit card. So that's a great tool that we use. Calculate not just the top of funnel, but your sales funnel. And then after you've done that and you still feel that there's um, opportunities there, then create your ads, launch them. We typically launch on Google first, collect data to make sure you're seeing success before we launch them on other search engines like Bing or social media, uh, whether that's uh, Facebook or other channels. And then from that, you've got to look at these campaigns on a regular basis, 
optimize them and change them um, because it's uh, it's a very competitive uh, environment and if you're not managing it you can spend a lot of money quickly uh, and not see the return that you're looking for. Our third point is how do you convert more prospects into customers? This is a critical area and it's often overlooked by many many organizations. Um, Target uh, Marketing had an article that uh, was quoting Forrester Research and said the average conversion rate on websites is about 2.9 percent. Frankly, I think that number is high. In a lot of cases, when we're working with organizations that are trying to improve their conversion rates, it's closer to really the the one percent or one and a half percent range. But we're going to use three percent for this example. But that would be a benchmark that. If you look at your website and are using things like Google Analytics, you can decide what sort of conversion rates you have uh, currently on your website. But let's take that conversion case of 2.9% and let's go back to the example we were using earlier. And if you happen to be the, a B2C company with 1,600 uh, visits a week to your website, times 52 times 2.9% would give you 4,300 raw inquiries per year. The thing you can use here as uh, when you understand your traffic is, is though, are those going to be sufficient to drive um, to your sales channels to actually close and will digital actually support enough revenue activity that meets your business objectives. But the, the comment that I want to make here and that we're going to talk about is if you could just increase that conversion rate slightly, how many more inquiries could you actually receive? And the way to do that is something that we call the 4x4. Four four. The 4x4, four four, it's this conversion guide that we've developed internally that we work with clients on. And the 4x4 four four are really the four things on the left. The first thing when you have a page, uh, whether it's a landing page or a website, is are people able to quickly recognize who is the company? Do they appear credible? What are they offering? Are they offering the, the thing that I was searching about, the product or service I was searching about? And what's the call to action? Is the call to action compelling enough that it gets the person interested to want to place a phone call or uh, fill out a form? Because when we're talking about conversion here, we're talking about both. We're talking about a way where somebody identifies themselves so either your inbound sales team uh, or your sales organization can follow up with them, whether it's by email or phone. You want to make sure that the call to action is is uh, compelling enough that you get that buy-in. And then the other four elements of the 4x4 four four strategy are really the competitive, buy the, the buying modalities that the Eisenberg brothers uh, introduced several years ago. And if you want to read a good book, Waiting for Your Cat to Bark is an excellent book, I'd recommend it. But the thing that they talk about here is that there's four buying modalities. Uh, if you haven't done specific personas, then this is a great way to kind of get you in the game and make sure that you have information that's compelling, whether a person happens to be a competitive a buyer, a spontaneous buyer, a humanistic buyer, or a methodical buyer. Your online properties have to appeal to all the four buying modalities, otherwise you're losing traffic and losing conversion. This topic alone could take an hour and it might be a subsequent uh, seminar. Here's an example of a client that we worked with that happened to have uh, over 100 dental locations. And on the left, they had a website with lots of distractions. You could, because it was a website, as you know, most website has multiple navigations. We're putting X's over there because we want to avoid navigation. Anytime you have other places people can go, they end up being, uh, they, they, they suck away their ability, your ability to actually convert them into traffic. And so we're Xing out a lot of the areas where we don't want people to go. The really the big thing that we wanted them to do was to request an appointment. The other thing that we found that when we did some research on this is that almost 50% of the traffic was coming from mobile devices. And in the case on the left, it was not a responsive uh, website. And so when we redesigned it, not only we, did we keep in mind the 4x4 four four that we talked about on the previous page and applying to the four buying modalities, we also made it responsive. And so you can see the page on the right, we've condensed it, we've reduced the navigation, and the goal here is you can see some big, we, we made sure that people understood what we were looking for. We're looking for a request an appointment or, or request an appointment online, so either call 
or fill out a form to create an appointment. The interesting thing is here is after we launched this new page, not only did we increase conversion rates from three to eight percent, we also were able to reduce their cost per acquisition substantially and actually increase their lead flow. So let's look at an example of the same sort of idea that we were talking about earlier. If, if a person was getting a 3% conversion rate, going to 4.5%, some people, well, it's only a percent and a half. Really, it's a 50% increase in conversion rates. And you can see with the same amount of, of paid media spend, the number of conversions you have would go from 100 to 150. And now if you still have the same funnel, internally those 150 would equate to instead of 12 deals 18 deals or in this example $150,000 more of incremental business that month by just changing um, a web page into a highly convertible highly converting landing page so uh, in summary converting prospects into customers really review your online funnel and see and understand what your conversion rates. If you're using paid media, focus your, your initial landing pages on those activities because you're probably spending a lot of money with Google, Bing, other search engines on a regular basis. Start there. Conversions can help drive leads higher and, um, in your, and your uh, cost per lead lower. Then identify the kind of what sort, of con what, what sort of language would be identified for the buying modalities? And there's lots of information online. You can find more about that. Then drive incremental content and messaging around the four buying modalities on a very focused landing page with good calls to action. And then write um, your landing pages up with that information in mind. And then we always suggest do A-B testing. Don't drive all your traffic to your new landing page or website pages. Uh, drive some of it, do A-B test, pick the winner, and then continue to optimize. The fourth point we want to talk about is ways you can dominate local search. For many of the organizations that are on the phone today and others, you have locations. And locations could be sales locations, they could be retail locations, they could be uh, franchisee locations, they could be independent dealer uh, distributor locations. All of those are important if you're trying to be found in your local geography. And why is it so important? One in five searches on Google are related to a location. I'm looking for a siding contractor in St. Paul. And 45% of those have local intent. What they mean by that is if I'm typing in a siding contractor in St. Paul, I'm not doing that for fun. I want to find somebody in that geography. Or I'm looking for a hair salon in St. Paul. There's usually purchase intent associated with it. So that's why it's important that you actually show up. You have, you have a local presence. You need to make sure that you show up. So here's an example of I'm happen to look for an internet service in Walker, Minnesota. Again, we've got paid ads. You've got organic ads. We've already talked about those. Now we're talking about this middle area where you see the map over up on the top right. In this case, it happens to list Arvig as a local provider of internet service. That's the area that we're talking about. And one thing you need to keep in mind is that there's different search algorithms. This is the paid area. This, there's different search algorithms that are used between paid, organic, and local. So you just can't do the other two that we just talked about. You have to focus on local. It uses a different search algorithm. And we're gonna talk about the things that matter there. So if you have location-based, uh, organizations that you support on a national level, it's important to, to understand what those mean. And the first one we're going to talk about is called the NAP, the name, address, phone number. And I'm using a tool here that I would recommend called Moz Local. Uh, you can uh, do some searches for free if you want more extensive things you have to pay. But the net of it is, what I did is I found Arvig has multiple locations and I found that they have an ADA location where using this tool we actually found three locations. That's bad. You need to standardize and have one location. And here we have two. It needs to be verified like they've done in Walker. Eliminate the other one. And what you should do as a guideline, you can see that they almost look the same, but they're not the same. One has Avenue and one has Ave West. The way these things are indexed and correlated, you need one 
actual physical address and we suggest using the postal address that's typically assigned to you by the post office. Net these down to one, it helps with um, your search engine indexing for local. Another part of the Moz local element is actually tells you not only when your is your uh, name, address, and phone number correctly, how are your citations doing? And in this case, it's listed the top 15 and it can tell you which ones are missing and which ones are done and which ones are done well. In this specific case, out of a score of 100, this location scored a 16. So lots of room for improvement from a local search perspective. You have to understand though, that this is a very complicated ecosystem and they actually feed off each other. So if you have bad information as part of, like let's say you're using Moz Local as an example, if you have bad information to start with, it just perpetuates itself through the rest of the local digital ecosystem. There's over 200 directories and citations and places that, are, that, that you can be found from a local perspective. And that's why it's important to start with getting your data accurate and then focus on the top directories and then they will filter through some of these other directories so you're found more frequently online. So from a local search perspective, the first thing is, is research your listings and find out if you have physical locations, whether they're retail stores or independent dealers, make sure those listings that you have just one listing and Moz Local is a good place to start to find out if in fact you do have that and then verify it. Fix the NAP, the name, address, phone number, you know, that'll improve consistency and eliminate duplication. And then start with the key directories like Google My Business, Yelp, some of these other directories. Uh, and then actually, whatever you've done, make sure that you tell your other locations or, or put together a plan to have retailers or dealers or other franchisees follow this same format. And then lastly, and it's extremely critical, is get reviews. Uh, if you, once you have a client and you've uh, surveyed them and you know that they're going to probably provide a positive review, ask them for reviews on several of the review sites, those actually help uh, you come up in the, social, in the, in the local uh, directories. Our fifth point is what do you do with leads that aren't so hot? Uh, we're, we're suggesting providing some nurturing mechanisms to those leads. Market Sharp, Marketing Sherpa did a, uh, a survey and they found that 79% of marketing leads never convert to sales. In fact, we kind of used a funnel or, uh, chart earlier that kind of indicated the same thing. Unfortunately, what's happening is most of these leads are falling by the wayside because of a lack of consistent follow-up. So the place in the funnel that we're really talking about here is inquiries. When in inquiries come in, not all of them are sales ready. But lots of organizations, what they're doing is they're actually passing, in the example that we were talking about early, all 100 inquiries, they're assuming their leads, passing them on to their, their sales channel or their dealer channel and letting them do all the heavy lifting. Instead, what you should do is we should actually be um, finding about those leads and making sure that they're actually quality leads, passing those on to the sales organization and nurture the other ones through a set of communications, whether it's email, direct mail, another email or phone, uh, until those leads are ready to buy. And the reason you want to actually intercept these calls, especially ones that come from an online perspective, are the study that was done by Leads360. If somebody finds your digital property and they happen to phone you, if you answer that phone call within one minute versus just three minutes, you increase the likelihood of conversion by 400%. What we mean by that is that you're more likely to get that person's name, email, and phone number and convert them into somebody you can actually talk to, that raw inquiry if you do that. And the other thing you need to keep in mind and why nurturing is so critical, if somebody fills out a form and now you have to reach back out to them to actually follow up with them to say, hey, I see you contacted us, we'd like to contact you back to set up an appointment or whatever your next step is in the sales process, on average it takes, it takes um, six attempts to get 93% of those converted. Most sales reps or dealer channels just don't have the tools or the disciplines in place to call that many times. They'll call one time or a couple times and then give up. So you need to centralize and institutionalize these processes 
uh, before you actually turn leads over uh, to your sale, sales channel or your distribution channel. The process that we recommend would be this. If you, here's the, the funnel coming in. Remember our big funnel up here, it now comes into inquiries. Our suggestion is to intercept all these calls with, a, with an inbound sales team or an outsourced contact center. That way the person can collect that information. They can see where that homeowner or business is located and is it close to a dealer or a rep in a given geography. They enter that information into a CRM uh, database. They can use qualification criteria to determine whether that lead is hot. If it is and, they've, and it's a phone call, they can do a live transfer uh, to that uh, dealer or, or sales rep. Uh, if it's and send them a, a subsequent email, the goal there is for that lead. In this specific case, we're talking about um, a homeowner lead that they have an in-home demo. The goal is in this case, we're showing a, a decking job and then ultimately that that dealer actually reports back and lets us know in our CRM system uh, what happened with that specific homeowner in this, in this given example, or it could be a sales lead, same ideas apply. But if the leads don't close, the ones that aren't qualified, make sure those are pushed into a lead nurture campaign as opposed to sent to the sales rep or the dealer channel. And the reason this is important is this slide, is if you look at what happens when these raw inquiries come in, we work with a lot of organizations where our inbound contact center is actually taking those leads. We're finding that about, in this specific case with this with a client, about 57% are actually um, uh, qualified enough to get set into an appointment. But a full 20, almost 18% of them were disqualified right off the bat. You know, they, were taught, they were calling about a maintenance issue or they uh, had a warranty question or they were looking, you know, maybe they're, they were too small. So there are always going to be some initial disqualifications. And then those leads get set into, the ones that aren't disqualified get set into appointments. Appointments are issued, but you can see this dropout that we looked at earlier. We have 18 that were disqualified, 12 that were closed. That means that there's 70 people in various states of interest that didn't disqualify themselves that are still interested in your product or service. And it's very unlikely that the sales organization is following up with these 70 leads, assuming they're getting 70 next week or next month. So it's critical that marketing takes on that role and drives a set of communications that further substantiate the value proposition of your product or service and get more of those to a closed state. Here's just another way of looking at it. 35% of them still need uh, or more need nurturing and you can drive those further down the sales funnel and only take the ones that are, that are qualified and give those to the, to the sales channel. So in summary, on lead nurturing, really look at your sales funnel and understand how many leads you're passing on, those inquiries that you're passing on to your sales channel, how many of those really need further nurturing. And then set up a very simple campaign. Um, make sure that your emails, if you're using email, which we would suggest as a part of your automation tactics, make sure that they're responsive. Develop a nurture campaign with X number of messages. Start small you know, maybe three, four messages over X period of time. X period of time typically would say, you know, what's the typical buying period? Let's say if the typical buying period is a couple months, put in three or four communications over a three or four month, uh, a three or four month time period or two weeks, three weeks, whatever it turns out to be, whatever the typical buying cycle is. And then also don't just think about lead nurturing for turning more prospects into quality leads, but also use these same techniques to thank clients for their business, ask them for reviews, which will also help with local search. But the main goal here is you're trying to get more qualified leads back to your sales channel and let them focus on the quality leads that you pass along to them. The last thing we're gonna talk about here is how do you find ways to improve your programs? Web Marketing 123 did this study and they said, which channels have the most positive impact on revenue? Well, we already talked about email as part of a lead nurturing strategy. We talked about uh, SEO as part of driving more leads to your website. We talked about paid. The biggest 
area was the not sure. What is actually driving positive ROI? And the reason that most uh, companies say that they're not sure is they don't really have adequate measurements in place. We've worked with many organizations and we will ask them what their business objectives are. And, and let's use an example. I want to grow in 2015, I want to grow my business by 10%. We then ask, what are the corresponding digital metrics that would actually support that? And we get blank stares and they go, well, what do you mean? Well, a comment there would be is if you want to grow your business by 10% and let's say you're getting 50,000 visits a month uh, in, uh, in traffic, are you gonna, are you, what's your plan to get that to 55,000 visits? If you're going to grow 10%, don't you have to grow your t digital properties accordingly? And a lot of companies just haven't thought about how important the online, their online presence is and how they have to map their business goals against their, their digital properties as well as all the other marketing campaigns that they have planned. So we generally say make sure that your business objectives are aligned with your online goals. Develop KPIs, whether they're visits, inquiries, revenue targets from your online properties. Set those targets and then make sure that you've configured your reporting tools to actually measure those. In a lot of cases where the 32% said unsure, it's because they don't have the proper measurements in place to understand which channels are actually driving um, their lead flow. A lot of the metrics that you commonly think about might be, you know, like web visits or traffic sources, you know, what kind of conversion rates you're getting. Some of these are, are great, uh, uh, great indicators and one of the tools that we often recommend is is Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager. Uh, make sure you're using these tools for top of funnel from your, from your online properties. Make sure they're configured properly uh, and you're getting the right information out, out of them so you know what online programs are working for you. But as we also talked about, sometimes cost per acquisition, return on ad spend, revenue by channel, some of these metrics are really part of your CRM tools that you have internally uh, as these raw inquiries come in. What we suggest is creating reports that combine some of the online thing, online uh, data that you're getting from Google Analytics with the information you're getting as part of your sales cycle, combining those to give you, uh, you know, better reports that show you, frankly, what sort of lead flow and what does your sales funnel really look like. Here's an example of some of the charts that we've done for clients where they're focused on conversion rates and organic landing pages and looking at things like, uh, you know, where they're typical sources are coming from. These are a lot, you know, we call these dashboards where you're trying to summarize a 33-page Google report into a dashboard that's more uh, read, readily uh, readable and more actionable. So in when we talk about this measurement and reporting area, this is how you're really going to improve. You have to have the right tracking in place, otherwise the measurements you're trying, uh, the goals you're trying to achieve uh, just won't manifest themselves. So here's a sales funnel chart, similar to the one that we've been looking at uh, around driving. We're try we talked about driving traffic, top of funnel. So in this specific case, this is actually a, a client example who was getting 50,000 visits of traffic a month. They also have retail locations. So 50,000 visits a month, we're tracking at the top of funnel that 10,000 of those are going to retail. They're looking at specific store or independent dealer locations. They're getting video plays. At, we call those top of funnel metrics. And then from there, you now want to start to track what's the middle funnel metrics. Middle funnel metrics, we think about as things, think about inquiries. You've actually asked that person to pick up the phone and call you. You now have their phone number. You now have their email address. In this specific case, these are the types of metrics that they're tracking. Brochure downloads, contact us forms, quotes, calls that came specifically from organic pages, calls that came from paid media. And now they have a total inquiry of 4,150. So those raw inquiries are now collected and put into their, and, and have, have been automatically collected and put into their CRM tools by source. And now they're tracking further down the funnel of those 4,100 inquiries, how many get qualified, how many gets appointment issues, how many actually had demos, and how successful was their sales organization in closing them. In this specific case, in this month, they had 490 units. Their average deal is 14,500. They're pretty confident they closed seven million, over $7 million of business um, from their 
online channels all the way through their sales organization. So this is top to bottom funnel tracking. It's not something that's easy. Uh, it takes time to get there, but the, ultimately this should be your goal so you have a better idea what's working and not working across all your channels, but specifically your digital channels. So in summary, what we would suggest is focus on one or more of those areas. What we talked about initially was, look, if your website, if you're not sure your website's getting enough visitors, start with a foundational SEO scan, and then after you've fixed your foundational elements, work on getting more relevant content. But start with the SEO scan. Screaming Frog is one of the want tools that we talked about that's free you can use. Leverage paid media so you're found more frequently. Uh, we had sometimes clients will ask us, well, should I do one or the other? And we say do both. You want to be found both from a paid media perspective and an organic perspective. That's like showing up twice on a billboard. Use the Google Keyword Planner uh, that can help you come up with a cost per click and then do some estimates on how far down the sales funnel, what would your actual cost per acquisition be. When you're trying to convert more prospects into customers, start with landing pages and make sure that it meets the four buying modalities that we talked about. And conversion also is about rapid response. And we talk about having a centralized area where you're taking in all the leads, qualifying them, and then only turning those over to, the deal, to your dealer channel for follow-up. Clean up the NAP. Remember that that's talking name, address, phone number. You can use Moz Local to do that. Get that directory con uh, consistency there. And then always ask your clients for reviews. That will help you dominate local search. And then centralize and qualify all your inbound inquiries. We would suggest having a centralized inbound team uh, before you push them out to your sales deal, your, your sales reps or your dealer channels. And then create a triggered nurture campaign for your not so hot leads uh, or actually even after you've closed your customers asking them for reviews is another great area to do a nurture campaign and then make sure that your online goals are aligned to your business goals if you're growing your business x percent correspondingly you should have your digital properties growing in the same way driving more uh, visits and more leads uh, and then set, make sure that you have your tracking set up properly in Google Analytics so you can measure consistently what's working and what's not working. Here's just a couple of examples of some clients that we've worked with that uh, around lead generation and how we've been able to help them, where in every case we've been able to help them drive higher conversion rates, increase lead flow, reduce their cost per inquiry, and as importantly, start to get a handle on their overall sales funnel from a lead generation perspective so they can actually determine, are we really getting the ROI that we would expect from an online perspective around lead generation? Here's a little bit about 3D. We're based here in St. Paul. We manage a lot of spend. We work a lot with clients and we have certifications around AdWords uh, and Bing. Google Analytics certification. We've made the Inc. 5000 list. We've got some other certifications with Salesforce. and uh, We've been named a Minnesota best company to work. If you'd like to learn more about uh, either lead generation or uh, some other eBooks that 3D has, we'd suggest downloading this free um, guide, Marketing in the Age of the Carefully Considered Decision. It's a more robust eBook. Uh, talks about a lot of the things that you that we've talked about here and subsequently more. Uh, it's available on our website. Or if you're interested in a free lead generation assessment, we're happy to provide that to qualified dealers. We can help score your current lead generation effectiveness and and really outline some opportunities that that might substantiate um, getting better lead flow and having a better understanding of what's working and not working. If you, if you have an interest there, send your request to sales at 3dmarketing.com. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Taylor and see if there's any questions uh, for us to answer. Sure. Yeah, so we had a couple. But uh, first of all, Dan, I'd like to thank you for your time and like to thank everybody for attending and for hanging in there with us today. So um, it looks like there's some more opportunities here for uh, the ebook to be downloaded. And if you have questions for Dan, uh, please type them in. 
Um, one question that came up earlier, which I, I think is a good one, you talked a little bit about landing pages, but a question that came up during the presentation was, what information should I collect on my landing page? That's a great question, and what we try to do is say, try to, try to collect as little as possible, uh, but enough that uh, you can actually follow up on the lead. So certainly phone number, uh, business name, uh, email address, and then maybe one or two attributes if you have multiple products, you know, what product are you interested in and maybe a time frame. We try to keep it less than seven uh, questions on a form specifically. Otherwise, you we find that the abandon rates uh, and get that conversion actually start to go down. So keep it minimal, but enough that you can uh, reach out to the person and use that reach out uh, as a way to collect additional information when you get a hold of them. Another one that came up is, do people really click on online ads? So you talked a little bit about pay-per-click advertising, you talked a little bit about SEO. Sounds like this person might be a little bit more skeptical of online advertising. Any any insight you can have on its effectiveness? Yeah, it, again, uh, about 20% of the people will actually uh, click on an online ad. The rest of them are either clicking on a, lo a local search or organic search. So we always tell clients, if it, it's good to be both places, but you have to understand from a paid media perspective, some of the reasons that people don't do it is they don't fully understand uh, the metrics, and that's why it's important to understand your metrics to know whether it's going to actually work for you. In a lot of cases, uh, it can work. In other cases, it doesn't, and we've worked with clients where they've said, hey, we'd like to do paid media, and we've done the research on keywords, uh, figure out the cost per click, what their uh, average selling price was, and in some cases, it doesn't make sense. So. Uh, yes, it doesn't always work for everybody. About 20% of the population do click on it, and it's important to be both in the paid area and the organic area. It's just what we call the double whammy. You show up twice, more likely that somebody's gonna gonna click on you. Another question here, kind of the classic quantity versus quality. So, qual or excuse me, quantity of leads is one thing, but how do I ensure quality? Mm. Yeah, the it the the quality of the lead is. Sometimes there's multiple things you can do. If you, if you feel like you're getting poor quality leads, it could be the messaging on your website. It could be the types of ads that you might be doing from a paid media perspective um, that is attracting the, the, the wrong kind of prospect uh, to your business. Uh, it could also be that you don't have a filter. Like my suggestion was there were have a specific set of criteria that you're using every single time. Uh, have it centralized so you have an inbound sales organization that's taking those inbound inquiries, they're doing the qualifications and then only passing those on to your sales organization. When you do that, it'll start to tell you, are you getting, you know, if if over 60% of your leads are unqualified, you probably have some messaging problems in either your ads uh, or on your website that's not attracting the right type of business to you. I think we'll take this last one right here. Um, it sounds like uh, we're in the process of redesigning our website. Any tips? So there's website redesign, there's landing page design. You talked a lot about landing pages. What would be some tips in just building a, a website in general or redesigning somebody's website? Uh, in, uh, great question. Interestingly enough, uh, if you're in the throes of a website redesign, uh, you really need to, to probably seek outside help. In a lot of cases when you're if, you ha if your current website has a lot of uh, organic traffic already and when you redesign a site, if you don't map uh, the old site to the new site, all that equity that Google and other search engines have built up, you can lose. And we've worked on three examples in just the last 18 months where clients have launched new websites, didn't have a very uh, robust SEO technical plan and in several cases lost over 50% of their traffic after launching on the new website. So there are some critical technical elements to it. If you don't feel you have a handle on it internally from an SEO perspective, hire a, a good uh, SEO agency to help you with the website migration so your traffic uh, goes up after a, a new launch of a website, not down. That's a great response. So thank you again, Dan, for your time today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, I hope that you will take Dan up on his offer to uh, download the ebook, and also uh, it looks like a great opportunity for a lead generation assessment. So uh, thank you again for your time, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, and I look forward to talking to several of you. Thanks again.